This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Let's play a game. Imagine you're the director duo of Matt Bettinelli, Olpin, and Tyler Gillette, also known as Radio Silence. 25 years ago when you were teenagers, Wes Craven changed your lives with his masterpiece, Scream, deeply informing the filmmaking careers that would follow. Fast forward today, where this pop culture titan of a horror series has had three more entries and has truly joined the likes of Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street as a defining piece of horror, one whose very name evokes the genre as a whole. It's been 10 years since the last film, and in the intervening decade, the legacy sequel or requel has become one of the most rock-solid ways to ensure box office success. The world is therefore ripe for a new scream. But there are two problems here. You've lost the guiding light, Wes himself. How do you possibly continue on without the man who incepted and guided this property for four films? And on top of that, while legacy sequels are making a financial killing, they're also commonly looked down upon for their artistic merit, or rather lack thereof. So what do you do? Do you fold up your ideas for a Scream 5 and let Wes's creation safely rest? Or do you take a chance, go for it, carry on Wes's legacy, and try to make the defining Scream sequel? sequel in his name. Well, to the immense credit of Radio Silence, they chose the latter. Scream 5 is here, a decade after the last entry and 25 years after the first. Another Scream? It must be a cheap cash grab, right? Well, no, actually. It's an integral part of this film franchise. Full transparency, I'm a huge fan of the original film, and I'm even fond of the sequels. Yes, you heard me, I like Scream 4. But I think the latest entry is the one that feels the most like a full-on sequel, a movie that has direct consequences and payoffs from the first, one which feels like it revived this story for a narrative reason, rather than to just make a sequel in a way that constantly pays tribute to and enhances that first film while also telling a story of its own. Oh, and it has some amazing meta-commentary that, in some ways, is even more of a scathing critique of legacy sequels and toxic fandom than the things Lana Wachowski had to say with The Matrix Resurrections. If The Matrix Resurrections came after the studio system and the way that filmmakers and studios are making legacy sequels, Scream 5 came directly after the toxic fandom that perpetuates the idea of a bland, derivative legacy sequel. Scream 5 is a movie you can easily enjoy as another Scream sequel. The best one to date, maybe? I don't know, time will tell. But which you can also enjoy on a deeper level and take a lot more away from if you really read between the lines and see what the film has to say. So make your popcorn, take your seats, and get ready to watch a video. You know, just some scary movie, nothing special. Oh, who are we kidding? Some scary movie? No way! Scream is fucking awesome, and here's why. But first... Has your town been ravaged repeatedly by Ghostface? Are you tired of the way the media only cares about the killers and not their victims, or even the people who brought an end to the terror? Do you want to start your own journalism outlet to pay tribute to the heroes of Woodsboro instead? Well, why not do what Filmspeak did with movies and set up a website as your home base? Squarespace can help you do it. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to build and expand your online presence. With Squarespace's award-winning designs, you can build an awesome website for your brand and customize every last detail with their easy-to-use interface, just like we did with our site. From our review of Scream 2022 to weekly recaps of the hottest TV shows, Squarespace makes everything we have to offer look great. Every Squarespace template includes a unique mobile design as well, so that users can have a great experience regardless of the size or shape of the screen they're viewing your site on, and Squarespace has marketing tools and analytics that can help your brand grow. So take a stab at squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to unleash your website onto the world, go to squarespace.com slash filmspeak to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com slash filmspeak, or click the link in the description below to get 10% off 
your first purchase. And thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Similar to The Matrix Resurrections, Scream begins with an opening scene that seems at first like a redo of the first movie opening scene. A teenager, Tara, getting toyed with over the phone by Ghostface, who traps her in an unending game of horror trivia, threatening her and someone close to her until she inevitably gets a question wrong, breaking into her house and attacking her. And again, like Resurrections, just as things feel so familiar that they're about to be repetitive, the course changes drastically. Tara survives. Instead of being the first victim of the film, Tara's survival allows her to become a new protagonist for a new generation of Scream, alongside her older sister, Sam. Now, legacy sequels almost universally will bring in these new characters while simultaneously bashing you over the head with fan service and reverence to iconic characters from the past. Ghostbusters Afterlife opens with Egon Spengler's death before cutting to the new cast. The Force Awakens mentions Leia in the second line of dialogue, and there are countless other examples. But Scream doesn't do this. Yes, the original cast returned. Yes, there are ways in which the film is interwoven with the prior entries. But the film doesn't just blast you in the face with it from the get-go. One of the first tie-ins to the first movie happens when we learn about Sam's backstory, about how she found out that her dad wasn't, well, her dad. Her dad was Billy Loomis. It's a nice reveal, something that makes you go, oh sh**, as an audience member, something that definitely plays on your nostalgia for the first movie, but doesn't force it or hit you like a sledgehammer with it. And I gotta admit, it was nice to see Skeet Ulrich again. It's a very fine line though, and Scream 5 does an expert tightrope walk along it the whole way through. And honestly, even when the movie does introduce the old cast, it still feels organic. It makes sense that Sam and Richie, her boyfriend, go to Dewey for help first. Not only is he the de facto figure of authority with his past, working for the Woodsboro Police department, but he has a history with Ghostface. He's always been the small town dude, the guy who never managed to make New York City work and so went home and left his life with Gail Weathers. Of course, that guy is still hanging around Woodsboro, and the brilliance of how Scream handles its meta existence as a legacy sequel really kicks off when Dewey enters the film. Dewey plots out how sequels go. Always go back to the past when you need a reason for the story to exist, which is, again, what so many legacy sequels do. Something about this one feels different, Dewey remarks. Well, the creator of pretty much any legacy sequel would probably use that phrase to entice you to watch their movie. It's different. It's not your dad, Star Wars, or Ghostbusters, whatever franchise you want movie. It brings something new to the table. And sure, maybe there are some great legacy sequels that actually do feel different. But I think most times you end up with The Force Awakens on a good day and The Rise of Skywalker on the worst day imaginable. And look, I'm not just sitting here trying to pick at the Star Wars sequels, I really am not, but they are the framework for what so many of these legacy sequels base themselves around. Scream 5 is aware of that, hence its subversion of scenes from the original film and its quick deviation into a completely different story from what any of the previous four films were doing. The moment where Scream comes into its own and announces itself in an entirely new film is probably when we first see Dewey. But but it's pre-established with the first mention of Stab, a series of horror films that exist in-universe and were first mentioned in Scream 2. The Stab series has had eight entries, and they're very clearly, from how characters describe them, some kind of Scream-like set of films with a Star Wars impact. In fact, the first film is based off of the events of the first Scream movie. There seems to be consensus that the series hasn't been as good since the original films. Does that sound familiar? And that the eight Eighth film in particular, an entry directed by the Knives Out guy, Ryan Johnson, caused a giant torrent of fan backlash because it has nothing to do with the original film. Does that sound familiar? I mean, come on, change one letter in the Stab series and you get Star. Scream went there. It's dunking on the people who threw hissy fits over The Last Jedi. I mean, hell, spoiler alert, but when you find out why Ghostface is back and who the killers are, their motivation largely boils down to, well, we want to inspire another stab movie that's as good as the first one because we know best and we can engineer its existence. It's fucking ridiculous, right? I mean, it's completely feasible on the page, but in-universe, apart from being two psychotic killers, they're ridiculous obsessive fans 
fans. The kind of impossible to please fans that we see in the real world. Are you telling me I'm stuck in the middle of some fan fucking fiction, Sam asks in disbelief? Gee, if that doesn't sound familiar, kinda sounds like my reaction to The Rise of Skywalker, a film that feels like it was made solely to appease Twitter whiners who didn't like The Last Jedi. We're gonna come back to that though, because while all of that pays off in the climax of the film, I think it's important to talk a bit about how we get there. One thing that always gets stick from people about legacy sequels is the new characters, the sequel characters that people so often don't care about. Well, Scream 5's answer is to just kill them. Remember Judy Hicks from Scream 4? Well, to anyone who doesn't like her or her son, congratulations, the movie gets rid of them after about 60 seconds of screen time. Again, a little bit of an exaggeration, but still, they're done with quite quickly. It's actually borderline hilarious how little the movie cares about the sequel characters, maybe outside of Tara and Sam, who the movie invests itself in. And with the vacuum created by these murders with the ensuing panic, well, we get a quasi-cast reunion. Dewey and Gale get to have a moment, but our core trio never get to fully reunite. There's a certain melancholy to that that just lands. And with the story that follows, I mean, this movie is great, do not get me wrong, but I don't think that what happens is as important as why it happens. So I want to really focus on one moment in particular, Dewey's death. Dewey's death is great because it ties into, addresses, and overcomes the problems with so many similar scenes in legacy sequels. I've already mentioned Egon Spengler's death in Afterlife, but let's just go back to it for a moment. It sucks. It's only in the film because Harold Ramis died in real life. It happens right at the start with absolutely no proper buildup other than shock value. It happens in a flash and then the movie is pretty much done with it. The quote unquote stakes have been set. So. Bye, Egon. See you later. Han Solo's death scene in The Force Awakens, on the other hand, arguably the template for how legacy sequels kill legacy characters, fares much better. And Dewey's death scene takes a lot of the beats from Han's death and effectively pastes them into the moment, right down to how it is shot and edited. So how does our figurative Han Solo here have a death scene that feels properly rewarding despite playing into that trend and lifting from the most famous example of it? Well, for one, just like how it makes sense for Dewey to be stuck in Woodsboro, just like it makes sense for him to be the authority figure people gravitate to in a crisis, it makes sense for him to be the one to go back to make sure Ghostface is dead after a fight. He's the protector of the group, always like the surrogate big brother, or I guess the surrogate uncle or father in this case, and he has been since the first film. And he specifically goes back to shoot Ghostface in the head, like how Sidney shot Billy in the first film. He uses a lesson he learned from her to try and protect everyone, and his good intention dooms him. It's a brutal death, and it enrages you as a viewer in the right way. It's shocking to an extent, but not necessarily surprising, and because of the calculated way it is implemented in the film, it doesn't feel like a mere lazy rehash, but quite purposeful, especially when the killers and their motives come to light. It plays into how savvy horror audiences have gotten, how customary such sudden and shocking main character deaths have gotten, and that a big death often of a legacy or important character in films such as this is the cheap and easy way of creating stakes. As the killers state during the climax, they're unafraid to kill off legacy carries because their movie has stakes. The fact of the matter is, Radio Silence is directly challenging that easy and cliched idea that studios and filmmakers have an over-reliance on. There is more than one way to give a movie stakes, and in fact, studios and filmmakers should be looking for new ways to ante up the drama in their stories. Of course, Dewey died like Han Solo in this film because the killers knew he would come back armed with the knowledge of his previous encounters with Ghostface and weaponize it against him to kill him. They wanted him to have a glorious Han Solo-like legacy death because they have no imagination. That being said, as filmmakers of a Scream movie, Radio Silence also had to honor the character of Dewey and his integral role in the franchise. And like the world's most talented trapeze artist, they managed to pull off this insane balancing act. And maybe that means you're gonna have both sides of the legacy sequel debate. Those who hate films like The Force Awakens for its over-familiarity versus those who hate The Last Jedi for its disparity, complaining in equal measure about Scream 5. I guess that remains to be seen. 
but I think that's just a testament to how brilliantly this film walks that tightrope. And on top of that, I don't think Radio Silence are phased by such criticism if it exists. I mean, the film even pokes fun at YouTube critics. <laughs> you know, hey, not like you're watching this on YouTube or anything, um, or, you know, not like we're nitpicking fans. Eh, yeah. Look, we deserve it. We suck. The snippets of criticisms of Stab 8 that we see in the film feel like they were copy-pasted from Twitter or from certain videos on this platform that came out in the wake of The Last Jedi. It's a cheeky and shameless jab from the film, and I think it earns it because of how effective of a sequel it is. Someone has to save the franchise, says the killers, about Stab. Well, I guess we can count our blessings that Radio Silence made a film that so effectively makes fun of arrogant fans who think they know better than the creators without killing anyone. They get one final stab at the kinds of fans that Richie and Amber are, too, when Gail ends the film with the decision to not document their killing spree, not add fuel to the fire they tried to start, and instead writes a piece about Dewey, honoring the man that he was, the strong, kind-hearted sheriff who laid down his life for the betterment of others. It's almost kind of like if Episode 9 of Star Wars didn't kowtow to the loud minority of people on Twitter after The Last Jedi came out. But just because the the film takes such a big swing at toxic fandom doesn't mean the movie lets the filmmakers of legacy sequels entirely off the hook. I mean, Scream even self-deprecates its own nature and existence. Radio Silence aren't above poking fun at themselves, but even in the film itself, every time it tries to do something interesting, new, and different, the filmmakers only allow it to a certain extent since, in the story, the killers are dictating the direction, pulling them back to the original. Hence, two killers. Hence, Dewey's death, thanks to the killer's awareness of how they killed Billy in the past. Hence, the climax that happens in the same house as the climax of the first film. I mean, even something as simple as Sam trying to flee Woodsboro plays into this. She literally can't because the killer steals her sister's inhaler and, unbeknownst to them, lures them back to that house. It's such a brilliantly layered commentary. I mean, this film is really impressive in how it juggles all of these different pieces these ideas about toxic fandom and legacy sequels alike without dropping the ball or drowning out the story. Even the performances reflect this. The legacy characters act so passive throughout the movie because they don't care, they've seen this before and are unimpressed by the killers. When Sydney goes to the house, she calls the killers out for being the most derivative of everyone she's faced so far. The killers retort, well, we got you back, didn't we? But the reason is that they got them back to Woodsboro out of necessity, rather than them actually wanting to come back. The fan killers basically try to rub it in the face of the legacy characters, like, don't you care? Isn't it important to you? Don't you want to pass the torch? And the legacy characters respond almost in a black comedy sort of way by pushing one of the killers onto a stove, literally passing the torch with a resounding unspoken no. Because this is the fifth film, the movie also sort of knows that the killers are obvious. Dewey guesses it on the first try, so they actually have to work twice as hard to get you off the scent. To that end, they pose interesting ideas such as, what if Tara was one of the killers all along, only for it to be exactly who you thought it was at the beginning? That was what made the first movie so effective. The twist isn't that Billy is the killer, it's that Stu is helping him. And they kind of do that here, and it works. I think the fact they even have you doubting yourself is very Wes Craven-esque and really impressive. It just goes back to making a purposefully derivative version of the original while actually in the larger context making a good movie with biting commentary. That's a dangerous game to play, doing the thing people roll their eyes at to prove your point. But... Scream really excels at pulling it off. But Scream 5 isn't just coming after legacy sequels. Oh no, it's coming at everyone, knives out. The film lovingly jests elevated horror and pokes fun at its alleged pretentiousness. Hell, it even takes a swipe at that particular niche's fan base, their obsession with poo-pooing stab-fest slashers and looking down on movies like Friday the 13th or Halloween. But it also acknowledges that we need more films like The Babadook or or The Lighthouse, or The Witch, because otherwise all we get is an unending run of legacy sequels, bad ones. And finally, Scream 5 takes on the general discourse that surrounds toxic fandom. In the film, you've got the media not calling Ghostface, well, 
Ghostface. To me, that's kind of in line with the whole thing about how toxic fans constantly treat writers, filmmakers, hell, even people with far less creative input, such as actors, like absolute shit. Think of all of the horrible things people said to Kelly Marie Tran, all of the garbage they piled on top of her to the point where she deactivated social media and it was talked about in the news like Star Wars fans expressed disappointment over The Last Jedi on social media rather than entitled crybabies harass actress because she acted in a movie they didn't like. It was so ridiculous and I think Scream is the first film to really call that particular element of fandom out for how gross it is. So you know what? Good on Radio Silence. Good on them for making this film. I just hope that when the inevitable sixth entry is made, that they can weather the inevitable storm of criticism they'll get, regardless of whichever direction they go in. Look, Scream 5 is not going to be for everyone. It can be overly obnoxious, annoying, too meta, I get it. The film pokes so much fun at itself, plays into the tropes of legacy sequels so hard that I can easily see why someone would be off-put and not necessarily vibe with the direction the filmmakers were going in. But if you're willing to accept that, I think there's a really smart commentary being made here. And it's not just, well, they just did another legacy sequel for the sake of doing another legacy sequel and for the sake of making another Scream. This feels like a movie made by true fans who understood and respected the mission statement of Wes Craven when it came to Scream. The film opens its credits with for Wes, and I think that is such a great tribute to the man and his genius, and it does far more than just give him lip service. I think Wes would have really loved this entry. Hell, if we hadn't sadly lost him, I could even see him having made Scream 5 eventually. Because while it is the scathing criticism of toxic fandom and legacy sequels we've all been waiting for, much more than that, I think it's the Scream movie we've all been waiting for.